there are many there are many needs. I was just thinking about that this week. The the number of needs we have, ways in which we can serve, and ways in which we can minister to people in our own country across the world. I read this week that about 9.2% of the world lives in what they consider to be extreme poverty, which is less than $1.90 a day. That is 689 million people living. In the, in the USA, which is, think of the American dream, 11% of them li live on less than $35 a day. In South Africa, 19% of our population lives on less than 28 rand a day. $1.90. About 5.5% of the world, that's 270 million people, between the ages of 15 and 64, are addicted to or, or have an reliance on drugs. There are, is apparently in South Africa over 1 million heroin addicts. 28% of, of our country, of our population, has an alcohol level that is described as being harmful or hazardous. And 15% of our country has what they would consider to be a significant drug problem. In 2009, we had one million orphans in South Africa. In 2017, that number has grown to 2.8 million, had grown. Today, there are apparently 3.7 million children orphaned in our own country. If we expand this to orphaned and vulnerable children, there are 660,000 that fill that category in KZN alone. 42% of South Africa's children are impacted by poverty, death, abuse, alcohol. As our world hurtles towards destruction, we can begin to see that the needs are great. I just read this weekend, last year, almost 700 children were born to mothers between the age of 9 and 10 in South Africa. About 17,000 children were born to moms under the age of 17. But let, let, let's add to this. The child labor statistics, the child trafficking, prostitution, the current reliance on many countries on government's assistance. The, the, the problems are real. There's real disasters. These needs are desperate. And, and I do believe that as individuals and as community and as churches and as believers, we, we need to seek how, how we can help overcome or at least alleviate in some sense many of these problems. But we also need to remember that many of these needs are temporal needs and desperate needs, but not ever, everlasting, not continue. They're, and they will be with us, the Bible tells us, throughout. There's a, greatest need in the, a greater need in this world. At the moment in the world, we have 12.3%, well, 42.5% unreached, and 16% of the world is currently superficially or minimally unreached. 3.3 billion people have yet to hear the gospel. In South Africa, 12% of our country, call it a million people, are considered unreached. People who have never, ever 
heard the gospel. That's, that's one million people in South Africa, 3.3 billion in the world who are currently, at this very moment, still at enmity with God. Are currently in a situation that they will spend all of eternity enduring the wrath of God. That's just those that haven't heard the gospel. Think of all those that have become well acquainted with the gospel, but have rejected the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They have a desperate need. Because the, the greatest need we have in the world is essentially peace between God and man. Sinful man needs to be reconciled with a holy God. There are many other needs, but, but that has to be the core, the, at the heart of the greatest need. Sinful man being reconciled, redeemed. Sinful men having their sins atoned for. Otherwise, they will spend eternity outside of God. Many of us have brothers and sisters, moms, dads, friends, neighbors, work colleagues that do not know Christ, have not yet come to an understanding of the importance of the work of Christ on the cross. People who will most likely spend an eternity experiencing the wrath. And, and, and this need, this great need, is, is not met by having greater obedience in our lives. It, it's not met simply by planting more churches. It's not met by simply bringing more people into churches. Or, or getting better Bible translations. Those might all be good. But what the need is, is the proclamation of the gospel, of the salvation through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross alone. What, what is needed is an understanding of His sacrifice. And that ultimate mediation that his sacrifice brings between a holy God and sinful man. In order to be right with God, we needed Christ to die. And we need to trust in his death. And we need to believe that through his death alone, we can be right with God. That is the need today. That is what should overwhelm our daily lives. That is what should preoccupate, preoccupy our desires and our passion and everything we do. This has always been the need. This was the need in the day the writer wrote the letter to the Hebrews. You see, those in, to whom he writes had for years tried to mead meet their need through route obedience or through external ordinances, doing certain things so they could be right with God. And he writes to them to encourage them, to motivate them, to hold on to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, to never let the gospel go to make sure that the gospel message that has been proclaimed by Christ would be their hope and their joy, that which encourages them, that which gives them an assurance 
of their salvation. Cling to the gospel. And, and he does this for us throughout the book of Hebrews by emphasizing for us the superiority of Christ as compared to anything else. We need to understand that the gospel message is a superior message to any other message. Because it is the gospel message, the proclamation of Christ alone, that offers real hope. There is no other hope outside the gospel. And in fact, the writer tells us in the book of Hebrews that it is the gospel message, the proclamation of Christ alone, that everything that has come before has been pointing towards. The, the old covenant, all the symbols, everything else is pointing towards the fulfillment of everything in Christ. And because of that, he is superior. Because everything points to that. This is the emphasis. And, and this morning, we're going to look at the superiority of Christ by gazing at the sufficiency of Christ. His death is once for all salvation for all. The sufficiency of Christ. Now we're going to read through the first 18 verses of chapter 10 and we're going to try and get through all 18 verses. All right. Fortunately, today we have a picnic, so there are no chickens in the oven. All right. We can relax. Chapter 1. I mean, chapter 10, verse 1. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of, of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every, every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, they would not have, they would have, not have ceased to offer it since the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any conscience of sins. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, He said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you take no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices or offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, declares the Lord, I'll put my laws on their heart and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I'll remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer an offering from sin. Let's pray. Father, guide us through this passage. Father, my passion this morning is that we would all see the sufficiency of Christ, which would then give us a hope in the gospel. Hope, Lord, not only for our own sanctification, but a hope for the lost, that we would become proclaimers of this gospel. In whose name we pray. Amen. We get in this passage to witness what, what is the sufficiency of Christ. And when we speak about the sufficiency of Christ, what we are speaking of is that it is the death of Christ alone that is sufficient to place man in right standing with God. Sufficient 
in that it breaks it brings us into a right relation overcomes all barriers all obstacles everything that puts a gap between us and God it is against this backdrop however of of an insufficient gospel the sufficiency of Christ seen against the the backdrop of that which was insufficient or, or to put it in in a hebrew way in hebrew terms we get to see the glory of the substance as it overwhelms the shadows and and, and the truth is that even even today in, in our own society in our own country in our own culture there are too many people holding on to what is an insufficient mediation and we're going to look at this comparison we're going to see first of all the insufficient and then move towards the sufficient notice in verse 1 the insufficient shadows this the, the, this is the analogy that the writer uses not in this portion of the book but throughout the book this idea of shadows and copies that that point to the reality that is to come if you were to take the first verse and kind of cut out all the parenthetical statements and just boil it down to one sentence the first sentence should read as such for since the law is but a shadow it can never perfect those who draw near you see that because the law is but a shadow it can never perfect those who draw near this is an incomplete substance the writer tells us the shadow is formed because of the substance if if you if you remove the substance there, there will not be a shadow the shadow points to the very presence of the reality the shadow can never exist if if the reality is not there if if the substance if the reality the real is gone then the shadow ceases to exist not as a text for since the law has but a shadow of good things so since the law doesn't have the fullness of of what is to come it's but a shadow of what is pointed to in that the law pointed all of us to our need for righteousness the the law created what is a standard of righteousness and then gave a path towards that righteousness the standard of righteousness was holiness and the, and the path was a sacrificial system but but that whole system was but a shadow that pointed to something that was to come there there was it was like a neon light pointing towards a great salvation a great righteousness a righteousness that is complete righteousness that gives real hope this this entire sacrificial system was was put in place now the text says but a shadow of the good things to come it was it was put in place to to point to something there there is something better coming i'm going to put this law in place and all these regulations in place and i'm going to hold you to them this is going to be what righteousness looks like but understand this is but a shadow because there is a righteousness to come which is far superior far better than anything you'll get but this is what's in place the writer puts it in the negative as well instead of the true form of these realities the, the, there is something greater it's it's not complete it's it's an image it's it's not quite the final form the the true complete form of the realities think about this the passover that was celebrated was a very real experience in the nation of israel they would celebrate it on a, on a on a regular basis the entire passover 
But the Passover merely pointed as a shadow to the reality of the sacrificial lamb who is Christ. That's why John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The, the Day of Atonement that was also annually part of the nation of Israel pointed towards an atonement that was available in Christ which was to come. The whole sacrificial system, the slaughtering of all the animals pointed towards the finality of the once for all sacrifice which was, who was Christ. The obedience to the law pointed to a obedience in Christ outside of the law. See, the law was never equipped to save. What it did, it was it pointed to the need for salvation and then pointed towards the provision of that salvation who is Christ. It was an incomplete shadow. But not only was it an incomplete shadow, notice, it's, it's, it's incomplete atonement. At, the idea of atonement is, is that of making peace. At, I always remember it, I'm from Funnabelle Park, we're on the brightest. At one moment, when we become together, this at one. And, and the whole idea is that we have a holy God and sinful man being brought together coming as one. And it says that it can never, notice this shadow, it can never make perfect. It can never bring to completion. It can never bring to a state of finality the, the completed task, those who draw near. No, no matter how faithfully you fulfill the law. No matter how faithfully you follow the shadows, no matter how obedient you were, it was unable to bring about your atonement. It, it, it could never do that for you. If the desire is peace with God, then the shadows were unable to meet that. It could not do it. Even if you did it day after day, week after week, year after year, even if you're fully faithful, atonement is never achieved through your faithfulness. It's always achieved through that in which you have faith, in whom you have faith. Faithfulness to the shadows doesn't, is unable, cannot make complete. Think of the nation of Israel. What we read in Philippians, even Paul says, you know, I've, as to the law, blameless. As to zeal, I'm, I'm a persecutor of the church. But I count that all as rubbish. Except for the surpassing knowledge of knowing Christ and Him crucified. Paul says, those are but shadows, and those shadows can do nothing. That's for the nation of Israel. But, but how many today, in our own culture, in our own churches, in our own spheres, believe that, that they can be faithful, that they can trust these shadows, whether they live good lives or they attend strong churches or they read the work regularly, word regularly or they do good works, they believe if they do all those things, then they can be right. Never can you be right through your faithfulness. Never can those shadows save you. It is an incomplete atonement. You cannot bring about atonement. Too many people base their salvation on that which they do and not on what he has done. The truth is that hell will be filled 
with many of those who have followed the shadows to the letter of the law. Try to work their way into a right standing with God. It's no atonement. And in fact, the text goes on and says it's, it's, it's an incomplete sanctification. Notice the text, it says, verse 2, Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would have no longer any conscience for sin? Think about that, he says. If the sacrificial system actually worked, why do it? If, if the Day of Atonement was successful, why do it again? Why come back day after day, year after year? if they were actually successful. But what happened was that the people were still left, the text tells us, with a conscience of sins. They knew despite their faithfulness, they still understood that there was something in and of themselves that made them unclean with the Holy God. There was still something that pricked their consciences. If it weren't, then, then those who did it would have been right. The, the truth is, even the most faithful Israelite, the moment he turned his back on the Day of Atonement, was looking forward to next year's Day of Atonement because he understood his sinfulness. And in fact, the text tells us that these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. So he says, what it actually does, every year, every day, when you wake up and sacrifice, what they tell you is you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner. You need something to cleanse you. Every day, over and over and over and over again, we're reminded about our need for something greater than that which we can do. He's with the shadows. The shadow never removed the knowledge of sin, never impunged the conscience, but instead reminded us of this. The truth is, in fact, no matter how much blood was spilt, and the history books tell us that on the Passover days, there was so much blood spilt in Israel that the rivers around it ran red. Yet, they were still unclean because it pointed. But he has the hope. Notice verse 4 says, It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. There is no cleansing in the sacrificial system. It's impossible. But he has the hope. Verse 5. Consequently. I mean, now we talk about the, the sufficient substance. Consequently, when Christ came, this is that which the shadows have been pointing towards. When Christ comes, this is talking about the incarnation. With the incarnation of Christ was always the completed plan. It was always what God had in mind. In Genesis chapter 3, at the end of when the fall, Christ, God says to them, or says to the Satan, that your head will be crushed. The picture, the finality of that is the incarnation of Christ. In the ark the, the one door that Philip spoke of in the ark and the people that are saved through this one door, the fulfillment of that is the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Abraham, through you many will be blessed. The completion of that is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Passover, as I said earlier, the, the finality, the fulfillment of the Passover lamb is the incarnation of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ. Everything points towards that. The incarnation was not a 
reactionary move by God when the sinfulness of man got to a too great a situation. No, the incarnation was always the plan. It was the hinge. It was the fulcrum. It was everything and everything pointed towards. The need for the incarnation. It says when Christ came into the world, he needed to step in to a sin-cursed world in order to redeem a sin-cursed world. It was necessary. This is the finality. When Christ came into the world. And he quotes for us Psalm 40. Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. Notice, I have come to do your will, O God, as written me on the scroll of the book. There is in this the completion of the plan. This is what it's always been about. This is what everything's pointing towards, the finality of Christ on the cross. That is why Christ can say in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will be done. Philippians chapter 2. He did not hold on to equality with God. He did not grasp on to equality with God. But instead, what he emptied himself and took on the form of man, took on, became a servant, and died on the cross. That's why he came. He came to meet the need. It's a completed sacrifice. Notice. And he says in verse 8 there, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings. Behold, I've come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will we have been sanctified. It's amazing. Sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The idea there of sanctified is, is literally, it's the same word we get it holy from. It's, it's to be made holy, to, to be set apart, to be called out for God's purpose, to be made righteous, to be made clean in God's eyes, taken out from the normal and put into the service of God, sanctified. And he has done this. And by that will, that completed plan, we have been sanctified. How have we been sanctified? Through the body of Jesus Christ. Once for all. I, I love that phrase, once for all. Because it literally, the, the idea is there, once for all people. No, no matter where you are, no matter what your culture is, no matter where you were raised, doesn't make a difference. Christ is the answer to all. And it's for all time. Never dissipates. S saves me now. And it is the body of Christ that gives me hope for the future. It's, it's everything. I, I, I need nothing more. There, there is no other hope. You, you get this? Us sinners from every tribe and tongue and nation and culture made holy through this once for all sacrifice, Jesus Christ. It, it deals with the enmity. It, it, it completes the work. It's, it's never lost. It's never insufficient. It's all we need. How, how, how greatly superior is that to the sacrifices of the old. Not only that, but it, but it goes on. It's an amazing passage. It brings about complete victory. Can look at the comparison in verse 11. Every priest stands, notice, daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. It's like trying to rake leaves in autumn in a windy car park. 
which is futile. We did this when I was at, working at Grace Community Church. We had a parking lot. I don't know, it must have been 5,000 cars. And we had to sweep the parking lot. It takes us the whole day. And by the time you finish over there and you work your way this way, you stop here, you pick up the last pack and you look back and it's like, yeah, I'll get it back and start all over again. And you sweep day after day, which is what we did. And that's the priests. Every day, the priest got up, stood at the door. Old Levi came to him. Here's my lamb. Oh, Levi, you again. I saw you yesterday. Oh, another sacrifice. Oh, okay, see you tomorrow. Every day. But, verse 12, but when Christ offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he what? He sat down at the right hand of God. No more standing. No more waiting. No more doing anything. It's, it's done. It is finished. It is over. I've sacrificed once for all so that all can be made right with the Holy God. This victory is over. He sat down at the right hand of God. It was done. When one sits down, the work is over. It's completed. His enemy is overcome. Those opposed to Christ defeated. He who oversees those opposed to Christ is defeated. Folks, it's good to remember that we are not waiting for Christ to overcome Satan. He has overcome. And he has sat down. He's simply waiting for the mopping up operation, getting it all subdued to him. And then he comes victoriously. This, this is Christ. It's a, it's a complete victory. It's, it's not a temporal victory. It's not a for a couple of minute victory. It's a once for all, always defeated. And now he sits down and he's waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by a single, notice the text, for by a single, verse 14, single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Those who are, those who, I, lo I love this, he's, he's perfected, done deal, for all time, those who are currently being made holy. So, 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 so God has saved us. He's currently in the process of making us holy. But guess what? Our pe perfection is guaranteed because he died. You are not what you will be, yes. But everything has already been done to ensure what you will be. Christ has done it. Complete it. Complete forgiveness. And the Holy Spirit bears witness. Quotes Jeremiah 31 verse 33 onwards. The, the new covenant, the fact that God will internalize and our hearts will be changed. It's not about outward conformity. It's about inward transformity. And verse 17 says, I'll remember their sins and their lawless deed no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering of sin. Our ongoing conscience of sin is taken away because it isn't based on your works, but based on His grace. You got this? The, the, yes, yes, we sin. I don't know about you all. Yes, I sin. But I don't have a conscience before God of my sin because I know that through the sacrifice of Christ, He has cast the, my sins as far as the east is from the west. I praise the Lord that there is a conscience of sin in me. But the, the price has been paid. And it, and it should drive us to change. 
It is not a conscience that keeps me from God, but a conscience that pushes me towards Christ-likeness. I'm not overwhelmed because I think maybe I won't be with God. No, no, he's died once for all, paid my price. Done, my, my sins are, have been forgiven. Now I live as if I've been forgiven. His sacrifice covers our sins, pays the price. This is not a, this is not a okay, go on and keep on sinning, but an idea that we should grieve our sins and we should be careful how we live because of what he has done for us. The completeness, the fullness of all of that. See, this is the sufficiency of the cross. This is the sufficiency of Christ. He, he meets the greatest need of the world by drawing all people to God, by providing the sacrifice that brings them to God fully. Are you trusting in this one for all sufficient work of Christ? Have you trusted in the work of Christ on the cross? Are you resting upon the finished work of Christ? Folks, there's no other salvation outside of Christ. There's no other salvation outside of the finished work of Christ. You know those families, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, work colleagues, neighbors, you know what they need to hear? You know what they need to see? Is they need to see Christ and Him crucified. Because in Christ and Him crucified, there's great hope. Sufficient for all their need.